Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is part 18 of What If Naruto Was an Rosario Vampire. If you guys enjoy this what if, and want to see part 19 of it, comment down below, and let me know. And go ahead and check out other what ifs in the channel. Before we start please do support for more awesome content. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a like, and also share this video with your friends. So let's start this video. Tsukune's real improvements had begun. His mind and body had finally started to accept his sudden surge in chakra. Just two days after the incident with Katsubo, he'd gone from falling into water after every few seconds to being able to stand atop it perfectly. Immediately, Naruto had ordered him to force as much chakra as he could through his limbs. Tsukune had destroyed the ground and knocked multiple trees completely over on accident, almost scaring himself into a coma. Naruto had grinned at the development. The complaining Tsukune and a clapping class of students brought him back down to earth. At the front on the blackboard, written in chalk by Nakaname Sensei was manager. Aono Tsukune. The job. He prays, clapping along with everyone else. The teen in question was far from pleased, head resting on his desk, hands gripping at his head, moaning incoherently to himself. Without intending to, Mocha put the final nail in the coffin. Congratulations Tsukune, you deserved it. Grunting and twitching, he lifted himself up, looking straight ahead with bleak eyes. Naruto couldn't help but enjoy his torment. TCH, what the fuck is this? The sliding door slams shut. I skip out on homeroom for a while, and Tsukune suddenly becomes the class manager. Oh, Saizo-kun, you're late. Who? Shaggy blonde hair, a piercing under his lip, and a smug smirk firmly set on his face. He did look kind of familiar, and Naruto had seen the guy around the school a few times, but never bothered to pay him much attention. He was making his way down between the seated students. Instead of the school uniform, he had a long sleeve, multicolored and pretty obnoxious shirt on, along with light pants. The students chattered about him. Tsukune looked far from excited at Saizo's arrival, did he know the guy? He supposed it didn't really matter, nothing would happen during class. Humph, so you're still here. Saizo was in front of his desk, right hand in his pocket, a sneer on his face. Hanaruto. Hi. Don't hi me. A blink. The taller teen slammed his hands down on the desk. One of his wrists looked a little weird, like it wasn't positioned properly. After homeroom is over, I'm going to beat you into the ground. His tongue shot out, gliding across his upper lip. Loka won't be there to back you up this time. If you say so. Naruto poked his forearm with his pen, he twitched. You need to move though, you're in the way. Pressure began to be forced onto his desk, he could hear it beginning to creak. The end of his pen jabbed Saizo's index finger. He flinched. Stop that. Saizo-kun, if you could please take your seat. Though, so he'd listen to the teacher but not him. What a dick. Once he'd gone and Ikonami sensei had resumed babbling on, Tsukune leaned over and spoke to him in a quiet tone. You do know who that is, don't you? No? The other human's lips thinned. Kamiya Saizo. He said, as if that would refresh some part of his mind. It didn't. The monster who tried to kill you, Milka-san and I on our first day. Oh? Naruto shifted in his seat, a little more attentive. I thought he was bigger last time. He got a head shake. Things were going quite swimmingly. Of course, not as well as he had hoped, but it wasn't something he would complain about. As far as he was concerned, Fairy Tail's forces were mostly expendable, and the organization's division leaders didn't seem to care about the losses, so long as he kept delivering on his word. He would appreciate it if they could tone down on the noise, though. Their unnecessary war cries and screams as they died had been getting on his nerves. At least Akio was mostly silent as she fought, splitting numerous Jubi clones apart in single strokes. She was swift with fluent moves, and not a single breath went to waste. With every battlefield they moved to, she improved more and more. Their progress was far from astronomical, but it was satisfying to watch. He could safely say that he was happy at the moment. Or maybe that was just the near constant flood of the Jubi's power streaming back into his system. With every one of the Jubi's clones' deaths, a tag would be slapped on the corpse. It was wondrous how it worked, sucking the clones completely dry and withering their bodies to nothing, all the while beaming the absorbed chakra straight to him. Unfortunately, he was still oblivious, as to what had happened during his fight with Naruto. He had his own theories and guesses, but nothing solid. In the end, perhaps it didn't matter, a brand new and bright opportunity had presented itself thanks to that instance. Whatever had happened to the world once ruled by Shinobi, was in the past, he had to think of the future of the one he was residing in. It had been a few hours already, but it seemed like the battle between clones and yukai was finally coming to a close. Again, it was a victory, albeit a small one. They were all small ones. When he'd arrived in Tokyo, nearly all of the Jubi's chakra had left his body. From there, the mass of power had split into hundreds and thousands of chunks, scattering as far and wide as they could. That was the main offending reason as to why the retrieval of said chakra was taking so long, there was an entire world to search for these chunks. At least it was nearly over. 
Another year and he'd have it all back, possibly even less, if what he'd sensed hadn't fooled him, that being a much bigger mass of the Jubi's chakra, a fifth, maybe a quarter. I won't fail. He breathed easily, staring up at the full moon. I won't make a single mistake in this world. Tsukune was bored. It was the only day of the week of Monday, on top of it that he had a free period right after homeroom, and it was one that no one else in the newspaper club shared with him. He didn't mind it all that much though, it gave him some free time in the club room to just sit and relax away from everything. As he walked, Naruto popped into his mind him and Saizo both, more specifically. The Ashi hadn't started a fight with the blonde after homeroom like he'd said, and his friend had simply left for his class, instead of making the monster eat his words. Tsukune thought that's what Naruto would have done, at least, he seemed to enjoy getting into fights. Maybe he just didn't care about Saizo enough to bother. Oh well. He murmured to himself, moving around the corner. The club room was just up ahead. It doesn't really matter. A flash. Something sprayed through the air, soda. No, it looked way too thick to be soda. Milkshake. What a stupid guess, he was pretty sure he hadn't even seen a red milkshake before. Ah. Oh, he must have been dreaming. Had he gotten to the club room and fallen asleep already, and he just couldn't remember, doing so while dreaming. That had to be it. But why did the dream hurt so much? He could see an arm on the floor, a puddle of cherry-colored liquid forming around it. Whose arm was that? It hadn't been there a moment ago, and he wasn't aware that anyone else was even around. What doesn't really matter? You uh. He screamed, shouted, stepping back as fast as he could. Reality hit him all at once. He wasn't dreaming. That was his arm on the floor, his left one. A short stub had been left on his body, spurting out his blood all over the floor. Aha. He squinted, eyebrows furrowing together. What was happening? Oh, right, he'd lost his arm. He couldn't think clearly. Well? The voice that came from behind him. More blood spewed into his vision. His balance was lost all of a sudden, and he found himself falling face first into the floor. He attempted to move and stop himself, soon realizing that he only had control of his right arm and leg. What were you thinking to yourself just now? His breathing was rapid. He tried to form words, to scream out at all the pain. Maybe someone would find him as he wept. Nothing ended up coming out apart from gurgles and incoherent half-formed groans. His lips were quivering mess that wouldn't obey his command. Tsukune. That was a familiar voice. Mizer. He'd last seen her the day before, where she had come into the club room with shorter hair, before declaring that she was joining. Gin had provided little resistance, only complaining that the cute girls should have told him prior, so they could spend time together organizing it. Despite her previous actions towards them, the others had been mostly welcoming. Kurumu had been the exception, apparently preferring to get into an argument with the newcomer. It got colder. A lot colder. Almost freezing. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw something just out of the ground, growing rapidly until it pierced through the roof. Ice. Was he starting to lose consciousness? Sound was beginning to dull, his vision was giving out. Even his pain was starting to fade, left with his own thoughts. That was rude. It was his voice again, a sarcastic tone. Something pierced the ground beside his head, somewhat flesh-like. He didn't have it in him to flinch. You shouldn't move. The Ashi said. Not unless you want to see his head roll. Whatever had been said next was a murmur, nothing he could understand. But what followed it sounded like a car accident, and a scream to top it off. Have either of you seen Tsukune? Naruto noted that she looked distraught. Not since homeroom. He and Mocha had been heading towards their next class, and the blonde didn't have another class with Tsukune until later in the day. Mocha looked concerned. What's wrong Kurumu-chan? He's missing. She sounded certain, like she could provide solid proof in an instant of fast. Her brows were furrowed, the usual smile she had flipped upside down in worry. He wasn't in class just now, and... I'll go look for him. Naruto interrupted. He hoped that he sounded at least kind of bored, casual. Kurumu looked to be under enough at the moment as is. Now that she had brought it to his attention, he couldn't even sense Tsukune's chakra. She didn't look very relieved. Grasping her arm in his hand, he stared her in the eyes. I'll go get him, I can still sense him so he's fine. He glanced at Mocha, giving her own arm a nudge. You two, don't be worried. But, Kurumu. Naruto rolled his eyes, letting her arm go. Relax already. You two just get to your classes and we'll meet up after. Did he not sound convincing? He thought so, but the succubus didn't look very believing. Mocha smiled and moved forward, looping her arm around Kurumu's. Naruto's right, come on. She began to move her down the hallway. You're worrying over nothing, you'll see. Bye. They'd gone straight down the hallway for a while, taking a left near the end. Once they were out of sight, Naruto began his search, though not for Tsukune's chakra. He looked for the yuki of people he'd fraught, even Kaio who he hadn't been able to sense since his defeat. After filtering through most and judging that where they were wasn't suspicious, he landed on someone that garnered interest. Saizo. Hello. He was out beyond the school, a fair way from what the blonde could tell. Why? Naruto had no idea, but he was about to find out. 
Within the time frame of a moment, he was at the closest marker he had to Saizo's location. It was on a rooftop of one of the school's buildings, he couldn't remember which one, but even that was still far from where he was heading. He'd have to run. Damn it. Naruto leaped over the tall railing, hitting the concreted floor hard enough to leave marks, before pushing off towards the Ayashi, as fast as his legs would let him. He got closer and closer with every second that passed by, pushing straight through the tree line, spending a few steps on the murky lake, instead of going around it. Saizo could tell he was coming. That didn't matter, he wasn't trying to be silent. The Ayashi bulged and grew, nearly tripling in physical size. Naruto assumed there was only about 20 meters between them, but the monster had already begun to swing his arm. It was a good move on his part, Naruto was moving fast, and had cleared most of the gap before he'd reached the peak of his swing. If he hadn't slid under the giant arm, Naruto had no doubt he would have been sent soaring back into the lake against his will. The blonde sent his lick out, slamming it into Saizo's ankle with all the force he could muster. By the time Naruto had stopped his momentum and was back on his feet, the Ashi had slammed face first into the ground, sending shocks around the immediate area, and causing the trees to shake. Hey, Saizo. Naruto wrapped his hands around his ankle, though it was too wide for his fingers to meet each other. He took. TSK. Instead of accomplishing anything productive, he felt like his shoulders had nearly dislocated. The guy was heavy, he'd give him that. On the flip side, at least, Naruto had managed to move him a little. That greeting was a bit rude, don't you think? You could have seriously hurt someone. Shut up. Bellowing and swinging, Naruto was forced to move out of the way as Saizo stood once more, towering over the blonde. I'm going to kill you today, Uzumaki. Ah. He took a step to the side as Saizo's fist came crashing against the ground next to him. Chakra roared through his legs, and before the Ayashi could move again, the blonde slammed his foot into the large hand. The large crack and following grinding went ignored, as well as his pained cries. Sorry, I'm not dying today. Try tomorrow. Instead. He leaped up over the left arm that came for his right side. Why don't you answer some of my questions? No deal. Oh come on. He touched down, taking a seat on Saizo's shoulder. It'll be fun, I won't have to beat you half to death, either. I'll just stop blow. Naruto gave himself a pat down once he was back on the ground, the Ashi had almost taken a bite out of him. You almost had me there. Okay, one. Do you know where Tsukune is? No? That's a lie. On Saizo's next swing, he slipped under the massive log of an arm, and slammed the palm of his left hand directly into the Ashi's abdomen. Kanji zipped out and covered the hulking body within an instant. Naruto flipped his hand around for more support, grunting lightly as he pushed Saizo up, sending him flying straight into the air. It was almost impressive, how heavy he was even with it being reduced to an eighth. The tri-prone kunai popped into Naruto's hand, hurled into the air and whooshing right by Saizo's head without a moment's thought. A blink and the blonde was in the air at the Ashi's back, snatching his hair in one hand and slamming his feet into his spine. Chakra flowed rapidly throughout his body as they descended. The crash was loud, giving off a clap, mud and bits of trees soaring out of the area. The force had been strong enough to bend and break the few, dead trees around them. GK. Shut up. Naruto reared Saizo's head back, slamming it back into the ground not a moment later. You'll talk when I tell you to talk. Got it. The Ashi's body thrashed and bashed, his limbs soon coming to a halt as Kanji spread over them. All that was left, was his wildly roaring head. Ha. Waving his hand in a straight down the monster's large immobile leg, a gust of wind brushed by, deep cut splitting it open to the bone. Blood sprayed in copious amounts. You'll answer my questions. Naruto ordered. Disobedience will gain you another one. He gave the Ashi 10 seconds, yet he hadn't calmed down. The blonde slashed his hand once more, Saizo's calf ripped open. It seemed to get the message across, another 10 seconds, and his head had stopped flailing, his teeth chattering and grinding. You know where Tsukune is. Did he sound accusing? Where? Blood was leaking from between his sharp teeth, but nothing else came from his mouth within 10 seconds. The rest of Saizo's leg was open to the world in a fountain of red. Gah. Saizo's face was rubbing into the mud roughly, as if he was trying to rid his head of the pain down. He bumbled out. Keep going. How far? Too late, Saizo had stopped moving. Maybe he had gone overboard. Damn it. Naruto hopped off the Ayashi, snatching up what was left of his foot, and continued in the direction he'd been going in the first place. He didn't know how far he had to go, but it was all he had to go on. He couldn't sense Tsukune's chakra, nor the Yuki of anyone in the direction he was heading for that matter. Oh. Well, he'd spotted it. Or what he assumed what was it. It was an old building, a couple of stories in height, two giant windows without much glass left over. It was basically crumbling in on itself, probably an old building from this school, that the headmaster didn't have a use for. It also probably meant, that there was no cameras here. Perfect for people who wanted to stay under the radar. Saizo's body was dragged along the ground as he walked. There was still a little bit of life left in the Ayashi, but that wasn't going to help him any. He'd lost a lot of blood that had taken a heap of damage from their little spat. 
Saizo was going to die, but he still had a use to the blonde. The entrance to the building was what used to be an arch, now a bad mockery of his former self, only somewhat resembling one. Upon his entrance, people suddenly appeared in both his side and senses. 23, 2 being familiar and friendly. Thus as they had appeared, though, everyone else he could sense at the school disappeared. Seated on the couch, Tsukune's lone arm was chained to a sturdy pole above his head. He was very clearly unconscious, unmoving with his eyelids half-opened. Cruelly, his severed arm and leg were laid under him, a small pool of blood having pulled around them. At the very least, they had bothered to bandage up his open wounds. Mizu was on the couch beside him. She was awake, though she might as well not have been. Bruised and beaten, she stared at Tsukune without much highlighting her eyes. So you did show up after all, Uzumaki. Was he the leader? Two scars marred his rough face, a dark jacket hung loosely over his shoulders. He didn't wear the school uniform, though he did have the tie on. He was right about that. Hey. Naruto brought his arm forward, tossing the barely alive Saizo towards the Ashi's feet. The other twenty were scattered about the room, leisurely seated or resting in their own way. They were confident. You know me, but I have no idea who you are. Could I get an introduction? A dismal smile lit up the man's face. Of course. He spread his arms out wide, indicating to everyone else in the room. We're all out Kasi Ashi. He declared it almost proudly, taking a moment of his precious time to indicate himself. And I'm Mido. The guy who's going to tear you limb from limb. Apparently having been waiting for Mido to finish his speech, an Aokase Ashi took steps towards Saizo his hair was wild and spiked, messy, his pupils thin slits on like milkers. Naruto brought his attention back to Mido. Like what you did to Tsukune. I did tell Saizo and Moroha. Briefly, possibly without intention, his eyes flickered to the Ayashi crouched down by Saizo's side, his index and middle finger were resting on the downed, transformed Ayashi by now. To take it easy, but they like to be rough. Unfortunately for you, I plan on doing much worse. Ah, really? He's dead. The Ayashi, Moroha, apparently, announced. His lips formed a thin smile. That takes a lot off us, doesn't it? Yes. Mido agreed, though he didn't seem to pay much attention. Saves us from having to dispose of the loser ourselves. Naruto chuckled lightly, shaking his head in bemusement. Moroha. He called. I tell you to be careful about corpses that your enemy has handled, but there really isn't much of a point anymore. What do you? Interrupting Moroha, his hand receded back inside his arm with a loud crunch. Following the shout and scream as he scrambled back along the ground, was the rest of his arm. He was dead within moments, his heart and neck silencing him as they imploded, the rest of his torso, head and limbs following shortly after. Soon, he was gone kind of. His body was still there, just in so many different pieces that he couldn't be seen. The display had put the Aokase Ashi on edge, but they didn't make a move. Well, that's one. Twenty more to awe. Four more presences made themselves known behind him at the entrance, again two familiar ones. He took a glance behind him, Milka and Kurumu were both injured, but none of it looked very serious. They had an Ayashi each behind them, keeping them in place. I thought I told you to go to class. He turned back to Mido, sighing. Ah, well. I'm glad I made precautions. He didn't need to look, he knew what was happening. Their sudden and very short abrupt shouts were enough, solidified by the sounds of flesh being ripped apart. If that wasn't enough, the leg and head that flew into the middle of the building was. Naruto. Yes. What did you do? Milka's voice was quiet. And what is going on? Tsukune. Kurumu had seen Tsukune in his condition, undoubtedly. She made a dash for him, but Naruto snatched her arm and yanked her back behind his body. Stay behind me. He told them. A bunch of people in front of me are about to die, don't get in the way. And don't touch each other either, there's still two uses on that. Ha. Huh? Mido didn't look bothered by the deaths of his three comrades, not to say that he looked glad though. You really think that you're capable of taking all of us, don't you? Yes. Naruto intervened before the Ayashi could continue. Come at me all at once, or one at a time, I don't care. The result will be the same. I'll take the latter. Mido shrugged his jacket off, rolling his shoulders and cracking his neck with a one-sided smirk. That arrogance that you spout, you're a pure breed, aren't you? Shit like you gets on my nerves. I wouldn't know. Mido's right arm grew in an instant, grotesquely, about as large as Saizo's. The skin on his face and arm had twisted, protruding unnaturally. His right eye was wide open as far as it would go, straining. The yoki he was emitting was dangerous, Saizo's was laughable in comparison. Well you became ugly rather quick. Ha! Naruto stepped to the side as the enlarged limb shot at him in less than a second, but was forced to take the full brunt of his swing, when Mido swiped to the side, sending his body soaring through the wall of the abandoned building. Naruto. Is that all he had? Mido sneered at the newly created hole. And he dealt with you three so easily. Milka wasn't sure what she should be thinking. She wasn't really sure that what was happening was actually real. Naruto had been beaten and sent who knows where in an instant, without any trouble from his assailant. There was Tsukune on the couch, was he even alive? 
and Mizer, what had they done to her? No need to worry. She jolted out of her thoughts. The other Mocha had spoken to her, something that didn't happen much at all. What does she think of Naruto? Mocha had thought about that more than once, but could only figure that outside of his blood, and a certain respect for his ability, she didn't seem to care. Mito turned his attention directly towards him. His lips twisted upwards as his mouth opened, but no words came out. I told you already. A sleek line of blood went from Mito's right hip up to his left pectoral. I can take all of you on. You chose to come at me alone, that's fine. Half of Mito's torso tipped forward, slamming into the ground face first. His right, severed and grotesque arm fell beside it, the rest of his body soon following and toppling onto the torso. But you're an idiot. Naruto was standing right behind where Mito had previously been, still facing away from her and Kurumu. What was going through his head right now? He killed Fori Ashi brutally without, so much as blinking. He killed him. The shouter was seated on a large wooden crate, wide-eyed and shaking. His hands gripped his pants in panic. Fuck this, I'm getting out of here. No, you aren't. The Ashi had gotten up to run towards the back, but something sleek and shiny had ripped through his upper torso and embedded itself into the back wall. Naruto shook his head, bending down and gently placing his hand on the uneven ground. The cool breeze passed by them. Unless you can kill me, none of you are getting out of here. They visibly hesitated. Nervous glances were shared among them all. Before long, one of them had taken the first steps forward, a stupidly grinning man with a dark beanie. He was also the first to suffer. His arms and head were nowhere to be seen in the next moment. Naruto put his foot on the side of his stomach and kicked the corpse onto his side. He wasn't going to give them time to coordinate in the least. Two Ashi had been standing beside each other. They were next. She could hear the bones break as their backs were slammed into the walls. How many were left now? She didn't know, there was no time to count their numbers. A handful of them had transformed, or tried to, Naruto had sunk several of his tri-pronged kunai into their chests and heads, before they could make a move. He was brutal, without mercy. They screamed and shouted as their demise came. Mocha. Kurumu didn't sound confident, almost scared. Who is that? She couldn't answer. She wasn't a stranger to death, Yukai fighting and killing each other over even petty matters was normal and commonplace. But Naruto was a human, a polar opposite of their kind. Yet even then, he came to a school like this, and blended in without a problem. Their existence, culture and way of life didn't seem to bother him in the least. What made him so different from all the other humans? A loud pop made her ears ring. A bloodied skeleton slid across the ground, jaw wide open. The skin it had been encased in had been left behind about 15 met years back from where it had came. There was Fori Ashi left. In just that tiny amount of time, he'd deal with them all. Corpses, blood and body parts, both the ashy and human-like in appearance, were littered all over the abandoned building. The remaining were grouped together, parts of their bodies either larger or different in their own form. Naruto was holding one of their dead comrades by the neck. He tossed it towards them without apparent care. Upon landing, a light blue light tripped out from his side, slamming into the roof. Three others followed not a moment later, producing a mostly transparent wall around them. Ha! Naruto patted his school uniform down. A gust of wind washed through the building, and at that moment the four in the barrier exploded in a bright flame. It looked strong, and she was afraid that it would burst out to consume them too. It didn't. It's okay. He turned to face them for the second time since their arrival. His smile was casual and half-hearted. Nothing had changed. Come here, I'll take that dirty seal off of you. Mocha hesitated for a moment, but only a moment. She sprinted towards him, throwing her arms around his neck and burying her face in his chest. He let out a huff from the impact, but she ignored it. You're still Naruto. She said. Was it a question? Right. Ah, uh, yeah. She looked up at his face. It was still the same, his eyes even had a glint of amusement twinkling in them. Why? Are you okay? That's kind of a new seal, so I didn't reel. I'm fine. Mocha pushed. No reason. I'm fine. She felt his arms wrap around her waist. She leaned into him. Okay. Ah. She lost her footing, suddenly hoisted up over his shoulder. What are you doing? I can't waste time. Naruto marched forward. Where to? Towards the touch where Tsukune and Mizu were from what she could tell. They're both alive, but if they stay like this, Tsukune won't be breathing for much longer. They really did a dodgy job patching him up, probably didn't want him alive for more than a couple of days. Aha. The voice was amused, ominous, but didn't sound threatening. Where was it coming from? He looks like he's going to die, if you don't do something about it, Naruto-kun. I know. Did Naruto know whoever this was? Then maybe I can help out this once. Where are we going? Naruto reached up and attempted to snatch the blindfold away, but was thwarted by the old headmaster slapping his hand away. As simple as it was, the blindfold kept him from trying to memorize where he was being led. If it wasn't there, he'd easily be able to do it with Sasuke's eyes. Well, he had agreed to the blindfold originally, so it was his fault, and all he could do was deal with it. Was this the headmaster's way of helping him out? 
It didn't seem very productive. At least Tsukune and Mizu were the academy's medbay. Mizu would live, she'd been beaten bloody, but nothing fatal had been done to her body. Tsukune was a different story, it was surprising that he was still alive even now. His left arm was gone, and he'd lost so much blood that it wasn't funny. There was no way a normal human could survive the wounds he had. You can remove it. It was about time. The sun. He flinched, squinting his eyes against the sudden light. He wasn't anywhere near Yokai Academy, the scenery was way too different for that. There was also the fact that he couldn't sense anyone that was familiar scratch that, he couldn't actually sense anyone. It was like there was no life anywhere close to him. They are. It was off-putting, to say the least. He'd always been able to sense someone, even if it was insignificant. It didn't help his thoughts that the headmaster had been right beside him just a few seconds ago. Taking a deep breath, he sat down on the soft ground, the innumerable amounts of flowers swing in the light wind. He closed his eyes, letting himself feel the. You don't need to do that. Eh? His eyes snapped open in shock, body jolting backwards, the back of his head colliding with the soft earth. Huffing through his nose, he repositioned himself in his seated position, and stared at the girl in front of him. She was cute. The short, amused smirk and red slitted eyes reminded him of Mocha's sealed personality. Was it even how he was supposed to refer to her when she was like that? He had no idea, it was a strange situation with that girl. Her long pink hair, on the other hand, was like the happy and excitable Mocha he was used to. That's where the similarities stopped. Her face was different, puffier cheeks and thinner lips, and she was much shorter than Mocha was, she didn't even look old enough to be a teenager yet. A thin, white dress covered down to her th eyes, contrasted by the black stockings going just above her knees. Are you okay? It wasn't a nice question. Rather, she was mocking him. Who are you? Ah. Uh. She wagged her finger in front of his face. That's for later. Stand up. Naruto frowned. Who was this little brat trying to boss him around? Despite his thoughts, he listened and rose to his feet. The moment his legs had finished extending, his arms rose up in front of him defensively. Something screamed at him in the back of his head to do so. Kurama. No way. Kurama didn't scream, he also didn't sound even remotely like that. His instincts. They were screaming for him to stop whatever was coming, he was dead if he didn't. That had never happened before, essentially, it was his brain yelling at his brain to do something, and he could hear it happening in real time. They crashed into his arms, instantly breaking his defense. Was he flying? The clouds were moving by so quickly just watching it made him want to vomit. His arms felt like they had been destroyed, moving them even a little bit pained his body immensely. He couldn't dwell on that for long. Naruto had come to a sudden stop. Are you okay? She sounded less mocking now, but not in the least concerned. Naruto ripped himself out of her grip, snatching her wrist and pushing her arm away from him, making sure to put distance between them. Is that? Kurama would never know how relieved the blonde felt at hearing his voice. Ask for yourself. He snarked. Not wasting any time, he drew in Kurama's chakra, his body igniting itself in a cloak of the Biju's chakra, Heori and all. An enemy I think. I don't know. There wasn't a reply. Of course there wasn't. Kurama would wait and see what happened first. Already going that far are you? Her tone had changed. She wasn't mocking him anymore, she sounded playful, his assumption aided by the smile she had on her face. It was one he was familiar with she wanted to prove herself, she wanted to show someone that she could kick the blonde's ass. As if he'd let that happen. It's shocking that you can fit so much confidence in such a small body. There it was. Her leg was in front of his face already, he barely even noticed her move. He didn't try to stop it this time, ducking under and manoeuvring himself around her body. An elbow to her back, that was sure to take her out in one hit. Instead, he was the one to get hit. Naruto's face crashed into the ground, body bouncing off the groundy and spinning uncontrollably through the air, grass, dirt and a myriad of flowers accompanying him in his flight. He regained control of himself quickly, landing back on his feet. How far away were they now? He'd been sent back much further than he had thought. This little girl was no joke. He was suddenly glad that he had gotten into the habit of placing Horatian seals on anything he touched when he was in a fight. In quite literally no time at all, he was at the girl's side, leg already extended. As far as he was concerned, there wasn't even a little bit of a chance for someone to counter or block an attack that was so sudden. Turned out he was wrong. She'd wrapped her small hand as far around his ankle as she could, the force of his kick ripping up the ground and digging a wide trench on her other side, going on for what looked hundreds of meters. Disgraceful. Naruto felt his body raised into the air, before it was swiftly slammed into the ground, the earth beneath him giving in to the force, a nice crater forming around his body. She dropped his ankle. Kurama's chakra went back into the Biju's control as the blonde just lay there. He hadn't even made the girl break a sweat. This is all you can do, and you're supposed to be one of the stronger ones. Stronger ones? Of what? Of you? The girl's lips twisted into annoyance. But that's for later. Much, much later. What's that supposed to mean? Don't ask, I'm not telling you. 
She offered her hand to help him up, but he didn't take it, and she retracted before continuing. It's not something you'll have to worry about for a long time anyway. So she was keeping information from him too. Just what kind of person had the headmaster left him with? Who are you? He'd asked it again. This time, she graced him with an answer. I. Okay. She didn't continue. What are you? Can't tell already. She gestured to herself, as if it was supposed to be obvious. Were those fangs? I'm a vampire. A very old vampire. They were. You don't look it. Thanks. Naruto pulled himself up into a seated position, hands resting in his lap. How old is very old? Well. I smiled, gently this time, kneeling down in front of him. This girl was crazy, she couldn't even stick to a single emotion. I don't know how many years it has been, but I'll give you an idea. You made that little jump through time over 50,000 years ago. Wait, 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 what? What did I do? What happened? It's a strange thing, time. Ayu went on. It moves at a constant rate, it never slows nor accelerates. No matter how hard you may try, no matter how strong you get, time will not budge. He was supposed to be as strong as a god, you know. Time didn't change for him either. She stood up, her eyes piercing through his. Every time traveler I've met has described it the same way you're at one point in time, then you're waking up at a different point. The transition feels instant, is that what you felt? Ah, uh, yes. How the hell was he supposed to know? He'd woken up in a hospital. That's not what happens. Time doesn't jump back and forth, from point to point, just because someone wants it to, it consistently moves forward and only forward. Time travelers don't jump, they hitch rides on the back of time, and get dropped off at their destination. Why are you telling me? Naruto frowned. I didn't come here for a lecture on time travel. I'm telling you so you don't mess with time again. There's no going back to your point in time you can only go forward. Have you ever heard about history repeating itself? It's a very literal phrase. Instead of going back, you will ride time until it reaches that point once more. The past can be changed, huh? Exactly. Her words did hurt. All of his friends, everyone who had fought a war with him, they were all long dead. There wasn't anything he could do about it. He grinded his teeth. You said that you'd met time travelers before. You tell them what you told me as well. No? Then why did you tell me? That playful smile had returned. Why did he always get stuck with the loopy people? You asked too many questions, I thought you would have come here with an actual reason. I did. Oh? Her lips spread wider across her face. Well, whatever it is, you might as well start running back to Japan. I'm not going to help. I'm not going anywhere. His fists tightened. He had a friend that was dying right at this moment. I don't know how the headmaster thinks you can help, but I'm not leaving until you do. I'm immortal. She bragged, though it was rather empty in terms of pride. You could cut me up into thousands of tiny bits, and I wouldn't die. The 50,000 years into the future that you send yourself, that's like a baby step in my life. I'm not changing my mind, so how do you plan on getting my help? I'll make you. You think you can? Tsukune's eyes started to twitch. Slowly, he could feel himself waking. His arms and legs moved, they ate, but he still had control of the mid-air smell clean, way too clean for him to be in his room. His eyes cracked open white ceiling, walls, tiled floor and a light curtain half cast around the bed. It was a hospital. Awake already. That was a voice he'd welcome right now. The blonde kicked the sliding door closed behind him, strolling over and planting the tray he had down on his bedside table. Cookies. What are they? Cookies. Naruto said like it should be obvious. Kuruma made them. Tsukune snatched one up as the blonde sat down on the chair beside his bed, tentatively taking a bite. A quick glance was made at the analog clock hanging up on the wall, noon. Why aren't you in class? I was suspended. Punishment for killing on school grounds apparently, even if they instigated. Naruto amused himself with a smile. At least, that's the excuse. What do you mean? I'm leaving, Tsukune. For well, I don't know how long. The blonde haired teen devoured the last of the cookie. Leaving. Why would you leave? He froze for a moment, a cold shiver running up his spine. He didn't open his mouth about it, but what would happen to him when Naruto left? It's a long story. I've got time. But I don't. I'm leaving when I'm out of here. A few moments of silence followed. Tsukune didn't know how long it lasted, but he managed to shove another cookie down his throat during it. When did you decide to leave? Naruto shuffled around on the seat. Not even an hour ago. That was rash decision making, wasn't it? What made him want to leave the academy so quickly? Tsukune scrunched his eyebrows together, dropping the subject for the moment. He was coming to realize something. Hold on, what day is it? Was that supposed to be Naruto's attempt at a bitter smile? It sucked. Wednesday. I've been out for over a week. No? You haven't even been asleep for two days. The blonde's lips twitched. How's your arm? That's right. Tsukune snatched up his left arm with the hand of his right. It was there. He remembered being attacked, he remembered losing it, he remembered seeing it on the floor. What? I made a deal, you see. They fulfilled their part of the deal, now I need to do mine. What kind of deal? What did you do to me? 
He'd shot the questions out of his mouth quicker than he had time to think, but he was still comprehensible to Naruto apparently. I told you it's a long story. Maybe I'll have time to tell you when I get back. Damn it. Ubi was tagging along with him. The headmaster had insisted. She needs to see more of the world, he'd said. Hurry up Ruby. I'm coming. It felt like the headmaster just wanted to keep an eye on him. Whatever, if he needed to keep something hidden then he'd make sure Ruby didn't have a clue. He heard her heels clicking against a few steps off the bus, before she was stood beside him. A breath of smoke and a wave from the bus driver later and they were alone, their transportation already halfway down the road. They'd been dropped off in Tokyo, but he had no idea where in Tokyo. It was a big city, overcrowded with way too many flashing lights, begging for anyone and everyone's attention. Naruto shuffled his backpack. Come on. He said, starting to meld in with the crowd, the witch hot on his tail. We need to find a place to stay first. He only had cash, so the receptionist had given him a bewildered look when he pulled his stack of notes from his backpack to pay up front. One room for the both of them to share, last time he'd stayed outside of the academy, the entire city he was in was destroyed. There was no way was letting Ruby stay on her own, even more so considering what they were in Tokyo to do. Naruto fumbled the stupid plastic card out of his pocket and swept it over where it had luck printed in red letters over a thin piece of metal. Down further. Ha. Huh? Down. Ruby repeated. Swept over the exposed plate, not the word. Oh. As if by magic, the door unlocked with a click. He twisted the handle and pushed it open, and took his first step inside its small clean, too clean. Almost unnaturally so. On the opposite end of the room was a window with the dark curtains drawn, a large screen plastered up on the wall adjacent to it, facing the foot of the bed. Neat, he thought, but he doubted he'd have time to relax and enjoy it. To the left of the entrance was a small kitchen, tile floor, a full-size fridge and a small bench top, three tall chairs seated at it on the other side. To the right was another door, no card swiping mechanism this time. Naruto assumed it led to the bathroom. Yep, bathroom. Naruto shrugged off the backpack and tossed it over near the window, idly wondering if anything in there could actually break. Ubi had already begun settling herself in. She rolled around on the queen-sized bed, as if she was trying to leave an imprint of her body on it, before kicking her heels off, they landed on the small bag she'd brought along. Sighing, she stretched her stocking-clad legs in the air, one after the other, rotating her ankle until there was a crack. They came crashing back down, toes curling as a relaxed expression began to settle on her face. Come on. She encouraged with a pad on the free space beside her. What was up with that smile? I don't mind sleeping with you. He probably could have done with the sleep, but it was already past 9pm. He wasn't in Tokyo to rest. No. He said. I'm going back out, you can stay if you want. Ubi pouted like she was still 12 years old, spinning around, so she was facing the foot of the bed and rolling onto her stomach. Her chin rested on top of her hands, legs aimlessly kicking at the air. Why are you in such a rush? She asked. What are we doing here in the first place? Headmaster wouldn't tell me anything. Reputation. Naruto made a mental note to piss off the headmaster when he got back, he could have at least explained to the girl what she'd be walking into. We're here so that I can build a reputation among yokai. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoyed. If you want a next part of this video, like subscribe and comment down below and turn on that bell notification and also check out the other videos that I have created and enjoy. See you in the next video. Peace.